and you're my prospective customer, and I say to you, do you have $100? Sorry, I'm sorry. Work with the speaker here. Just say yes. Okay. <laughs> she just found $100. So suppose I then said to you, all right, so you have $100. I'll give you two pieces of cotton, leather, and rubber manufactured under somewhat suspicious conditions in the Far East. <laughs> compelling statement. That's not exactly the Nike pitch for women's aerobic shoes. Nike has made two pieces of cotton, leather, and rubber stand for efficacy and power and liberation. And if Nike can do that for two pieces of cotton, leather, and rubber, imagine what you should, you should be able to do with eternal life. Hmm. Arguably a much better product. <laughs> Step one, make meaning. Step two is to make a mantra. I have to confess that I believe most of you have mission statements for your organizations and churches, right? How many of you have a mission statement? It's all the people with Windows machines. Um, most mission statements between you and I suck. They're too long, they try to address too many things, they're not memorable, and and it's almost no wonder why that they do suck. Now, I don't know where you're from, and I don't know, uh, you know how you've done it in your organization, but let me tell you how we do it in Silicon Valley, making a mission statement. It is a two-day off-site. When a company does it in Silicon Valley, it's usually at the Ritz-Carlton Half Moon Bay. There's a very hard correlation between making mission statement and world-class golf course. <laughs> so you go to this two-day mission statement building off-site with the top 50 or 60 employees of your company. You hire an outside meeting facilitator. Her job, and it's usually a woman, is to help the team communicate with each other, learn to trust each other, and to bond with each other and then to lead them in this process of creating this mission statement. The reason why you had to hire an outside meeting facilitator is that no one on your executive team could lead or communicate. Indeed, if you had that person, you wouldn't need to have the off-site. So anyway, you go on the off-site and the first day is spent in outdoor exercises. You climb ropes together, you fall into each other's arms. <laughs> You, know, you do all these kind of things, you're building this kumbaya spirit, and at the end of the day, you now like all the people you used to hate. <laughs> the second day, you're in a small room and you create a mission statement that's going to be good for the shareholders, the customers, the employees. If you're in California, it should also be good for the whales and the dolphins. <laughs> and you come up with something like this. This is for Wendy's. A fast food organization. As I read this mission statement to you, I want you to pretend that you're driving through Wendy's or standing at the counter and ask yourself if this defines your experience. <laughs> the mission of Wendy's is to deliver superior quality products and services for our customers and communities through leadership, innovation, and partnerships. Cheeseburger, french fry, coke. I'll take some leadership and I'll take some innovation and partnerships too. Now, don't get me wrong. I have nothing against Wendy's. I love Wendy's. I have four children. When the children outnumber the adults, when you have gone from man to man to zone, when you're... <laughs> For those hockey fans, you know, when, you, when you're permanently on a five-on-three kind of situation, <laughs> You've come to appreciate fast food. In our house, our favorite vegetable is french fries. <laughs> so don't get me wrong, I love Wendy's, but in all the times that I've stood there or driven through Wendy's, it has never occurred to me that I'm participating in leadership, innovation, and partnerships. I bet you that not one Wendy's employee, Trixie, Biff, mm. Tiffany, any of them, <laughs> I bet you none of them could repeat this mission statement. I'll further bet you that not even the founder of Wendy's could repeat this mission statement. And I know he can because he's dead. <laughs> this is what's wrong with mission statements. This is why you need to create a mantra to define your innovation. Wendy's mantra should be healthy, fast,
Three words that define why Wendy's exists. Somewhat oxymoronic, but healthy, fast, food. <laughs> Nike's mantra should be authentic athletic performance. Just do it is their customer slogan. Why they exist is authentic athletic performance. FedEx. FedEx has vans, trucks, airplanes. FedEx has an incredible IT infrastructure. FedEx can tell you that your package is on the left-hand side of a van on the second shelf from the bottom, going south on Highway 5 in the second lane from the right at Newport Beach exit right now. It can tell you all of that for peace of mind. And the last example is eBay. eBay is about the democratization of commerce. So, are there two or three words that can define your church? Not 20, not 50, two or three. That's the test. Healthy, fast food. Authentic, athletic performance. Peace of mind. Democratize commerce. Two or three words. That's step two. Step three is to jump to the next curve. This is about the perspective of innovation. What is innovation? Is it doing things 10% better? No, it's 10 times better. It's creating the next curve or jumping to the next curve. Let me show you a very good historical example. Ice 1.0. There used to be an ice harvesting industry in the United States. In 1900, 10 million pounds of harvested ice was shipped. This meant that during the winter, Bubba and Junior would go to frozen lakes and ponds and cut blocks of ice. Their idea of R&D was, why don't we add another horse? Why don't we get a sharper saw? Why don't we get a bigger saw? That was ice 1.0. Ice 2.0 was the ice factory. Now, it didn't have to be winter. It didn't have to be a cold city. You could freeze water in any city, any time of year, and then the ice man would deliver ice to your house. What a technological breakthrough. That's the second curve of the ice business. The third curve of the ice business is the refrigerator curve. Now you froze water in your house in a PC, personal chiller. <laughs> no more ice man delivering ice to your house, no more going to the ice factory. The very interesting historical fact about this is that none of the ice harvesters became ice factories. And none of the ice factories became refrigerator companies. And none of the refrigerator companies are becoming biotech companies. Because most organizations define what they do by what they do. I cut blocks of ice. I freeze water and then deliver it in trucks. I make little appliances that are personal chillers. If you define your organization according to what you currently do, you will miss the next curve. You need to jump or create the next curve.